This is going to be very liberating for a lot of people. I know it was for me. And so many of us have been trapped in a mental picture and a mental model that is not accurate and it's robbing us of joy, it's hurting our relationships and it has tentacles that affects everything. So we're gonna talk about that today and I think it's going to help a lot of people. But before we do that, I wanna talk about giving gifts and I'll give you an opportunity to rate how good you are as a gift giver, right? How good do you think you are as a gift giver? Um, I wanna show you uh, what it means to give good gifts. And so there are two parts to a good gift. Wouldn't we agree whether it's a birthday gift, uh, an anniversary gift, uh, whatever it is. Um, number one, it has to be heartfelt. If the gift isn't heartfelt, it's not going to land, right? You know that you've hit a home run when they open up the box and they tilt their head, right? If you, if you got a head tilter, it's over, game over, right? You got a head tilter and they go, ah, oh, what? So um, that's how you know. I, I, I learned this lesson when um, I gave uh, Lisa for her birthday, she opened it up and it was a cordless phone. And she did not tilt her head and go off, right? She was like, hey, a phone. I was like, You've been talking about how you'd love to have a cordless phone. Now, some of you don't even get this because you're too young, right? But when we were in the ancient days, we would have a cord on the phone that you would take to the room. She said, how amazing would it be if we had a phone that didn't have a cord attached to it? So I thought she's going to love this gift, and she didn't. So I learned that. Number one, it has to be heartfelt. Number two, it has to be a surprise, if it's a surprise and they didn't see it coming, right? Like if it's heartfelt and they go, ah, oh, right? And if it's a surprise, that's the grand slam home run. Now it has to be a good surprise. The one birthday where I took Lisa down to the basement and I said, happy birthday. And she said, what? I said, the treadmill. And then I made the mistake of saying, <laughs> true story, you said you wanted to lose the baby weight. <laughs> now, listen to me. Men, never say that. That is a really, really bad thing to do. So what I want to do is I, um, um, finally, I, I just remember the very next birthday, I gave her a birthday card and I put money in it and I wrote, I give up. I think this is what you want. Now I've improved over the years, but I'll never forget the scars, the early scars of the bad gift giving years. And I want you to lean to the person next to you, and I want you to look at this scale right here. Can we see the scale? This is you're a terrible gift giver. This is eh. This is you're okay. This is you're really good. This is you're great. Lean to the person next to you and share which caller you are. Go really fast. What are you? What are you? Okay, you're green. Okay, good. Good, good. All right, raise your hand if you're right here. Okay, we got some, how about right here? Raise your hand. Let me just go all the way to the end right here and you're red. You just wanna be honest? Yeah, hey, here I am. How many of you are sitting next to someone who thinks they're over here, but they're really over here? That's, that's where it really becomes interesting. Now, I want you to do something. Uh, on this same scale, rather than rating yourself, what I want you to do is I want you to rate God in what he has given you in your life and the goodness of his gifts. So would you put God over here, somewhere here, or is he over here? Is God a great gift giver, a good one, an okay one, a not great one? 
a terrible one. I think all of our experiences are different, and we will think of that in different ways. We're continuing our series on the book of James, and for those of you who are brand new here today, what we do in our service is we gather for about an hour, and we uh, tell God how much we appreciate him through music, Uh, and then about half of our service, what we'll do is we'll devote to studying the Bible, which is God's book for how to connect with him and how to make life work. And so we've been going through a book that was written by Jesus's brother, James, that has some really practical advice on living. And last week, what we did is we talked about how our lives will never improve until we understand how God uses trials to help us, right? Like right off the bat before James starts talking about relationships and improvements, until we get very clear in our mind that God can use trials to help us, then we're constantly going to be in a position where we're gonna look at life negatively. And so we looked at trials last week. Today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at God himself and the character of God. And our lives will never improve until we believe what God, if we can go to the next one, says about himself. Until we can believe that, There's no way we're going to look at life optimistically with joy and happiness. And this is the mental construct a lot of us are trapped in. And so what I want to do is I want to look at a passage from the book of James. It's in the first chapter. And so I want you to turn to James chapter 1, verse 17. And for those of you who are new, you're like, I don't have anything to turn to. We have a church app. If you can go to the app store and look up at CCV Philadelphia. You'll pull up the app. There will be in the app a thing that says Bible, and you'll show today's passage today, all right? If you go to this right here. All right, let's look at this, the verse. Verse 16 and 17. These are two verses I want you to remember. I want you to memorize these verses, okay? I want you to be able to come up to me next week, and I want you to, I want you to quote these two verses Because if you have these two quotes, the Bible talks about, I will hide my, I will hide your word in my heart. That if we have this at the ready, when we go through something, we're able to quote this to ourselves so we interpret it correctly, okay? So I want you to do that or you'll go to hell. Here we go. Verse 16. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters, because it's super easy to be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from God. It comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who doesn't change all the time. Like, is he good? Is he bad? Is he good this time? Is he bad? Is he good? Is he bad? like shadows that were basically my shadow. You can see right here in the light. You can just interrupt the shadow. God isn't like that. And so James reiterates a little bit of what we said last week. God's gifts are good and they're perfect. And then he says, don't be deceived. He tells us not to be deceived because one of the enemy's primary goals in life is to get us to believe that some things are good from God and some things are bad from God, okay? And what James is saying is that all things happen from God's perspective can be used for our good and they're perfect. In other words, when James says they're perfect, it's the Greek word telos, which is, which is the Greek word for completion. It's perfect. That, you know, one of the reasons we know we're humans is because we never give perfect gifts. There's always some measure of self-interest. There's in the receiving, there's always some measure of, of selfishness in it. And God gives perfect gifts that we absolutely need. Now, I know this because we're gonna do a little quiz right now. A number of years ago, I was in Giant doing some shopping and I ran across Um, the vegetable aisle and I saw celery and I said on Facebook how is celery still a thing I literally don't know one person who likes this stuff 
And so what I want you to do is I want you to lean to the person next to you right now and ask if they like celery or not, okay? Do that. Raise your hand if you hate celery, if you're in the I hate celery club, right? It gets in your teeth, right? Like, and there are other green vegetables that you can eat, so there are a lot of people that are in the I hate celery club. Now raise your hand if you're one of the ugly people in church and you like celery. Can we do that? There, well, look at this. What is the deal? Okay, so I'm a giant. I post this on Facebook, and literally within an hour, 211 people have commented on this, which proves two things. Number one, you guys are not working at work, all right? And number two, people have strong opinions on celery. First off, my supporters came to my rescue. My friend Tim offered this insightful critique. It's gross and it serves zero purpose. Thank you, Tim, right? And then out of nowhere, my friend Daniel came back with this zinger. You can't make most soups, stews, pot roasts, meatloafs, etc., without celery. It's a staple in our home, but primarily for cooking. Thank goodness my friend Rosemary came back with this theological insight. I give you an amen. Celery is a creation of the devil. And there were people who were on team, I love celery. Doris came to your rescue with this zinger. Love the crunch. And so this went on for an hour, right? Until my friend Tina posted this picture of a sloth eating celery. And I don't know if it was good or bad, but that, that basically was it right there, right? So I don't know if you're, you're, you're for or against celery. Um, but what about other gifts? What about the gifts that you have received in life? Everything that has happened to you. For those of you who are new here today, um, in the beginning of the year, I've shared uh, to our church family that I was going through uh, what St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul, in that um, I, I was um, seeing a counselor, and I was just angry, and it just brought up all of these things that I've never dealt with before. And I was just fuming week after week after week. Very first week, she asked me, are, are you depressed? And I'm like, I'm not depressed, I'm pissed off. I'm just angry. One of the ways I express my thoughts is I'll just write poetry. I'm not saying it's any good, but I just, I will. And I just, after one of these counseling sessions, talking about all just different things, traumatic things that have happened, I just, I just wrote this poem. I called it Asking for a Friend. I started, I mean he suffered enough, not to compare to Job or anything for that matter, but what's left for you to do? Blow over his house with a tornado? Hackers steal his 401k? Kill his kids? Yeah, not you, of course, I get it. You'd never do that. You have others do your dirty work or you allow it. Plausible deniability. What kind of sadist makes deals with Satan anyway? Is it boredom, humor, entertainment, pleasure? Be honest. I'm asking for all of us down here who have experienced cancer, depression, anxiety, divorce, abuse, neglect, schizophrenia, dementia, blindness, suicide, war, loss of parents, loss of child, amputation, school shootings, addictions, drowning, stolen children, poisoning, molestation, and trafficking. Are you the one we need saved from? And what James is saying is that, yes, we go through terrible times. And yes, there are people that have free will that's not, it's not connected to God, it's not coming from God. And then we just live in a broken world where things can just happen. And what James is saying is that I cannot start talking about how to improve your life until you believe what God says about himself. And so here's a phrase I want you to remember. I want you to snap a picture of it, I want you to write it down. And I want you to feel this. God defines and explains your experience. Not your experience 
that defines and explains God. Let me just say that again. God defines and explains your experience, not your experience that defines and explains God. And what I had been doing, she looked at me. She was like, do you believe in the goodness of God? And I'm like, I don't know. The evidence is, is pretty bad. And she said, you know what you're doing is you're taking your experience and you're extrapolating from that and you're looking at God and saying, God, you're like that because of your experience. And from human eyes, it's perfectly plausible to assign evil to some things. I mean, you'd be an evil not to call evil, evil. But that's not what James is saying. In the five chapters of James, he talks about things that are evil. But your experience doesn't tell us anything about what God is like. And so James says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of the heavenly lights, who doesn't change like shifting shadows. And we call God's gift good because God is good. And I, so I want everybody to repeat after me. We're gonna read this together. God is good all the time, every day, and in every way. He never changes. Now let's, let's say it again with more passion as if we believe this. God is good all the time, every day and in every way. He never changes. Now, I usually don't make things rhyme, you know that, but God's character doesn't change. God has always been good. We sing songs around CCV. I will sing of the goodness of God. And I want you to listen to these Bible verses all throughout God's experience with God. Nahum 1.7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. Galatians chapter five, but the fruit of the spirit, when God gushes stuff, what comes out of God? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. <laughs> Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And so what James is saying is that people are bad. They can be bad. They can be bad to one another. Things can happen in this world. People have free will. Uh, one of the memes I love seeing on social media is the one that goes, well, 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 if it isn't the consequences of the decisions that I've made, right? Like we make decisions and we see the consequences of that. God is saying, I'm good all the time. See, this is the, this is the central idea of the book of Jonah in the Bible. Everybody's like, ah, the book of Jonah is about some whale. It's not about a whale, it's no more about a whale than the two surfers off of the beach in California that were swallowed up by a sperm whale. Do you see this on social media? And they get spit out a little bit later. God tells Jonah, go, this is in the seventh century BC, God tells Jonah to go to Assyria, which is like telling you in 1941 to go to Nazi Germany and tell them to knock it off and to repent and change and believe in God. Jonah says, no thank you, and goes in the opposite direction. The people on the boat throw him over, fish, sea. He goes to Assyria, and lo and behold, people were like repenting. They're like, we're so sorry, we didn't know this. And then we see this picture of Jonah sitting down right here. And Jonah is what? He's ticked. And why is he ticked? Because Jonah looks up at God and he's like, I knew you were gonna forgive him. I knew it, that's why I didn't wanna go here. All the things that these people have done, they deserve to be blown up. But I knew that if I came here and I told them about you, that they would change. And then Jonah says this, he quotes, he says, I knew that you are a gracious God and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. This phrase, scholars believe, is the oldest statement of belief about what God is like. 
If you go to the next phrase, this is a little literal translation from Hebrew. You are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. Jonah's like, this is who you are. Given the opportunity, you will always be gracious to people. And so Karen, my counselor, said, do you even believe in the goodness of God? I, I said, I don't know, man, it's 50-50. You can toss a coin. Did you believe God is good? Like all the time, he never changes. And I was like, I've gone through so much crap. She said, I didn't ask if you go through so much crap. And then she said, and I give her credit for this, God defines and explains your experience, not your experience that defines and explains God. So my homework was to list all the reasons I don't believe in the, the goodness of God and then make, to begin saying this to myself. This is the box a lot of people are in. This is the box that some people here today or you're joining us online, you're stuck in this place. Your life can't move forward because you don't know who God is. You are looking at God based on your experience and telling God who he is and then you're disappointed with God. God never has a chance. But when you begin taking God at his word, then your experience begins to change because you look at it differently. And so, every time something happens now, I will say, I believe God is good all the time. It's just that person's a jerk. Or, or this person just, just having a bad day. Or maybe this person has gone through some of the things I've gone through, and maybe this is just a natural reaction, and they need grace and they need love just like I did. See, I think this is why some of you are really hesitant to fully turn your life over to Jesus. Right? You're holding out on him. Like you got one foot in, like the game Twister, and you got one over here, right? And am I going to fall over? Yes, I am. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Deep down, you don't think he's a good God, and so you don't completely trust him because you're like, if I do trust him, then he is going to make bad, he's going to make, take away all the fun of my life and make me do bad stuff. He's going to send me as a missionary to Uganda. Trust me, the only people who, are want, to, who want to be missionaries in Uganda are people that want to go to Uganda. God gives you joy and purpose in life and his job is not to make you miserable. And for those of you who are holding out for fear that God is going to make your life worse, God is like, come on. That is absolutely not the truth. God is good all the time, every day, and in every way. And the verse that I want you to memorize is James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting saddles. Okay, so what does this mean to us in 2024? Wonderful, Jonah thought that, Jesus thought that, James thought that, but what about what you're going through? What about what we're going through? Here's what I think the text is telling us. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Faith means believing in advance. While it's happening, I'm going to ascribe to this what will only make sense in reverse. That as disciples of Jesus, we know we have work to do. We know that we're on mission with Jesus. And honestly, it's probably going to be in heaven when he sits down. He's like, hey, man, come here. Come here. I know everybody else can wait, but come here. I just want to talk about your life, and I, let's just pull your life up and all these things that have happened to you. This happened two generations later so that your great-grandchild would do this, and then look at all the good that happened. This happened because of this person that you completely lost contact with. Their life was changed. You see all of these things when you step back and you look at the big picture. That is going to happen. That is what it means. Faith means believing in advance 
what will only make sense in reverse. Let me tell you two stories. When we were in the movie theater days, um, a couple friend of mine, they, they had a baby, already had two kids, they, they tried for a third, and then they had a son, and they were really excited, and then they came uh, to church one day, and they were just in utter shock and despair. They got the news that their son has Downs. And the dad was holding him, and I said, man, I, I totally... I'm so sorry that, and I just said this, come here, let me see him. I said, look at him. He's perfect. And he's ball. I'm like, say that after me. He's perfect. Come on, I want you to say the words. I know you're in the middle of the confusion and the anger, and you're thinking about your life, and who's going to take care of who, and all of that. Look at him right now. Look at this gift you've been given, and I want you to say with me, he's perfect. Here's another one. One of the, my favorite books is called a book called A Little Handbook on Having a Soul by David Hansen. Friends of his uh, were getting ready to give birth, she goes into the hospital and has like a last late term miscarriage. And they call up David, the pastor of their church, and he comes to visit. And he's like, it's just as awful as you would think it is. And I've been there with friends. It's as as awful as you can imagine. One of, one of the hardest punches in the gut anyone can take. And then David said, we stood up around her bed with a couple other friends and we gathered hands. And this is what I prayed. I prayed, God, we remind ourselves right now that you are a good God and in times like this, the worst that life has to offer, we may doubt that. But we know that you said in your word that you are good. We believe that and we are thankful. We are thankful for what has happened because we cannot see why it has happened. And we put our faith and trust in a God that is bigger than us and holds the universe in his hands. And I thought that was just an incredibly beautiful prayer to pray in a desperate situation. Because faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And so what I want to do is I'm going to put this up again, and we're all going to repeat this together. You ready? God is good all the time, every day, and in every way. He never changes. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being present in our life, even when we can't see it, even when, like, when I misinterpret things that are going on. In my rage against you, you revealed to me your goodness. And I just pray for people who are holding on to pain, who are holding on to bitterness. God, I pray that you would make yourself known to them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.